Amen, amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come into your presence this evening with joy, saying that you are faithful. We are so grateful to be here, to sing your praises, to hear your word, to fellowship together, and now we ask your blessing on our time of Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, as we've been going through our study in Romans, week by week, we have been seeing the beauty and the worth of the gospel in relentless grace, that the gospel changes everything. Chapter by chapter, we've been seeing how the gospel applies to us in so many different ways. And that's why in our attempts to appreciate and understand and articulate the gospel, the gospel has often been compared to a jewel that has many different facets on it. So many different beautiful truths in the gospel that apply to us in different stages and areas of life. That the gospel is a diamond with many beautiful facets. So guys, think about that diamond that you bought your wife when you were proposing. Or think about that diamond that was in the display case over that was really big and beautiful that you couldn't afford, right? You look at it and you see the light hit it and it shines and shimmers in so many different beautiful ways. That's why when we look at wedding rings, everyone wants to look at the bride's ring, right? They want to come and see it, post pictures of it, all that stuff. It's just not like that with us guys, is it? One of the, the brothers recently got married and I sort of went up to him afterwards and joked around like, dude, let me see your hardware, let me see your ring. And we both looked at it and we're like, yeah, looks like a ring, right? It's just not the same for us. But tonight, in our study, we come to a chapter in the Bible, a chapter in the book of Romans, that many have seen as one of the brightest shining facets of the gospel. A cherished chapter of the Bible as it displays the beauty of the gospel. So as we pick up in Romans chapter 8, let's consider where we left off at. You remember that Paul has been addressing a series of questions and answers in chapters five through seven, essentially asking how can the gospel actually lead to real change of life? How does it work in the day-to-day -day living? We saw that we are no longer slaves to sin, there's freedom in Christ, but yet at the same time, because of our sinful nature, we still struggle with sin. Then we see in Romans 7 that there's a discussion of the pull strings of the heart between the flesh and the spirit. And then as we analyze that, we are wise to allow these two pull strings to keep us from dangers. The one danger would be that of legalism, saying that real Christians don't struggle with sin anymore. Now, nah, the reality is we all struggle, don't we? But the opposite side is to avoid a license to sin, to say that, well, it's an attitude of permissiveness that I should just go on sinning because I can't help it. And so now the Apostle Paul transitions from showing how an avoidance of legalism and an avoidance of permission of sin finds its rightful place in assurance of Christ. Assurance of salvation that's found in Jesus. So the title of our message this evening is From Condemnation to Children of God, Life in the Spirit. We see that the struggle of Romans 7 that we've looked at teaches us how to fail forward. It teaches us how to struggle well in our weakness and our sin. The despair of Romans 7.24 is met with the declaration of Romans 8.1, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Remember, as Pastor Greg said on Sunday, Romans 7 to 8 is one continued thought. There's no break. So consider Paul's words. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, can I remind you tonight that deliverance is found in Jesus. It was Jesus who said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you whom the Son sets free is free indeed. These are great truths for us to consider as we look at our assurance in Christ. And as we do so, in this wonderful chapter of Romans chapter eight, we will see this amazing truth, that Jesus is a greater savior than you are a sinner. 
Jesus is a greater savior than you are a sinner, which means that Jesus is better at saving than you are at sinning. And I know that's crazy because we're pretty good at sinning sometimes, right? Well, Jesus is better at saving, amen? It was John Newton, the author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, who wrote these words in his old age. Although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. So let's consider these truths as we now look at Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Of course, you know that when Paul starts off with saying therefore, he's making a connection to what he's previously written. Someone argued that he's He's referring all the way back even to Romans 3 about his argument about receiving the righteousness of God by faith. Or, of course, it could be to the the previous chapters, 6 and 7. But it's Paul's argument, this whole chapter from from 1 to 7, about how the gospel changes everything. That because of the gospel, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. So Paul continues in his argument, and the whole flow of Romans is now culminating in this statement, in these two words. Now, we all have favorite Bible verses and favorite Bible words, and these two words should be two of them. No condemnation. Let's say it together. No condemnation. Again, no condemnation. Those words should echo throughout our hearts and our minds day by day as we hear the amazing application to the words of our Savior on the cross. It is finished. No condemnation. It's an amazing truth. Condemnation is, of course, a legal term. To be condemned is the opposite of being guilty or being forgiven. It's to be guilty. It's to be sentenced to punishment. So the opposite of condemnation is justification. One is to be declared guilty. Justification is to be declared innocent, not guilty. And so to be condemned is to be guilty under sin and the law, but to not be condemned is to be free from any debt or penalty, that there's no charges against you. The Apostle Paul has already used this language, that specific word, condemnation, in Romans chapter 5, verses 16 and 18, where he essentially argues that in Adam we are condemned, but in Christ we are justified. So consider Paul's progression here in this opening verse. He starts off by first saying, there is. This little phrase speaks of a confident truth. Not there could be, not there should be, or not there could be, or maybe will be, but there is. There's confidence there. He says there is therefore now, an interesting statement. There is therefore now. It speaks in the present tense. It's a reality now, not just in the future. It's because of the gospel and what Jesus has done that there is a therefore now, life change Now, it changes everything. So there is therefore now no condemnation. Paul uses very strong language here. What I mean by this is that it isn't just that Christians simply aren't condemned. It's that there's no condemnation whatsoever at all for all of eternity. You see the difference there? That Christians do not have condemnation at all. Paul is saying that both literally and categorically, condemnation doesn't exist anymore for the believer. That we could all say tonight, condemnation, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. But of course, how is this possible? How is this possible? Well, it's found in the next three words. In Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Jesus. This phrase, in Christ, is Paul's theological shorthand statement about our union with Christ. Union with Christ is to be one with him. Like a branch abiding in a vine, like a limb attached to a body, like a husband and wife united as one flesh depicting Christ and the church. And so we see that we are no longer in sin under condemnation but we are in Christ under grace, amen? Verse two, Paul continues on saying, 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Essentially, he's arguing that because there's now no condemnation for sin, there's no bondage to sin either. The law, which here doesn't refer to the Mosaic law, like the Ten Commandments, but rather to a principle or an effect, it's where the Holy Spirit frees us from bondage to sin. And this is true because of the work of the Son on the cross and the work of the Spirit in our hearts. This reminds us again and again what we've been saying throughout this study, that we are free from the eternal penalty of sin and from also the enslaving power of sin. It's eternal penalty and it's enslaving power and one day in glory from its presence itself. So Paul further expounds this truth now of no condemnation in verses three and four. Let's pick up together. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You see, the law, it can show us our sin, but it can't save us from our sin. It can show it, but not save it. But God can, and he did by sending his own son. I love that phrase. The law couldn't do it, but God did. But God can, and he did it by sending his son. It says here that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, of course, we know Jesus didn't sin. He was without sin, but he came into a sinful world, and he came as a sin offering. You see, the law commands righteousness but can't provide it, but God did through Jesus that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus lived a perfect life. He perfectly obeyed God's law. He perfectly followed God's will. And he went to a cross where my sin and your sin were placed upon his shoulders and his righteousness, that perfect fulfillment of the law, is placed upon our shoulders so we can now stand before God as being holy and just and pure. And he proved it and demonstrated it by rising again on the third day. And so it's through Jesus' perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his victorious resurrection that we now stand in confidence. God did it, and that's how he did it. You see, sin used to condemn us, but now Christ condemns our sin. What a reversal. Sin used to condemn us, but now Christ condemns our sin. Later on in this chapter, verses 33 and 34, Paul now asks the question, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Who is to condemn? Well, the world, the flesh, the enemy, they can all point their fingers at us and say, you're guilty, you're a sinner, but no one can condemn. Why? Because the answer, the solution, there's no condemnation because it's Christ, the one who died. And so, if no one can make a charge against us, if no one is to condemn, then nothing is to separate. Nothing can come between us and our Savior. That's why Paul ends chapter 8 by saying that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul begins chapter 8 by saying no condemnation and ends chapter eight, the application of it, with no separation. Oh, how important this truth is for us to remember each day. So often we can forget those two words, no condemnation. As we feel guilty over our sin, as we struggle over persistent guilt or self-righteousness or fluctuating between those two gospel enemies, we can take our eyes off Jesus and the cross that's why as Bible commentator Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said that most of our troubles in life are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse, Romans 8.1. By forgetting this, it leads to unnecessary guilt and unworthiness, that we can then only strive to obey God out of fear and duty rather, rather than motivation of love and gratitude. But as we remember this truth, Romans 8.1, we see how this verse gives us confidence 
but confidence not in ourselves, not confidence in the works of our hands, but confidence in the works of the one who has nail-pierced hands, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we can have confidence in all sorts of things, but most of those things are just hopeful confidence or wishful thinking or think positive thoughts about it or I love when people say, I'm sending you good vibes. It's like, good, what does that mean? Is that what that was or was that my lunch that I had, you know? What exactly are the good vibes you're sending me? But see, we have a hope so, not a no so. You know, the Super Bowl is coming up and of course there's a lot of chatter and anticipation about it. Who's playing again? It's of course the Patriots, right? Against who, okay, the Chargers? Just kidding, the Rams. I know all of a sudden there's Rams fans everywhere here in Southern California, you know? But what I, what I think is so funny, of course, each, each fan of the team is saying, my team's gonna win. And they have such confidence. But what's that confidence really rooted in? Not much, it's a 50-50 chance. That's why it cracks me up when I see that there's people out there getting tattoos that say Patriots, Super Bowl 53 champions. And then other people that say Rams, Super Bowl 53 champions. I'm like, man, someone is gonna have a lot of regret. That is not a very wise decision. They have confidence, my team's gonna do it. But it's not based on anything. That's not what our confidence looks like. Our confidence is, is in the blood-bought work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We can have assurance and confidence in what he has done. But we can sometimes fail to remember this. We sin and we think that God doesn't love us anymore. But the good news is we have to look no further than the cross of Christ that God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were sinners, he died for us. So look to the cross and hear the words, I love you and you're forgiven. Have you ever heard of the law of double jeopardy? It applies in this situation. It states that a man can't be tried twice for the same crime. And since Jesus paid the penalty for your sins, and since you're in Christ, God will not condemn you. He will not try you for those. And so the application for us is if there's no condemnation from the Savior, there should be no self-condemnation either. This is a summary of the whole ground of Christian assurance found in Romans 8.1. And now we'll look at the rest of the scriptures here as we consider how Paul goes on to explain how real change comes through relying on the work of the Spirit. So we'll see in verses 1 to 13, the Spirit of life, and in verses 14 to 17, the Spirit of adoption. We see in these verses that because of the Spirit, we are no longer condemned by Christ, but we are now conformed to Christ through the Spirit. We are no longer condemned, but instead we are conformed. What this means is that it's now our life goal and aim to become more and more like Jesus. The famous passage later in this chapter, verse 28, says that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But verse 29 provides some insight on what the good is that God is working. The good is that we are conformed to the image of God's Son that God uses all circumstances and situations in our life to make us become more like Jesus. That gives us perspective, of course, on all the things that we're going through. And so now, instead of becoming like the sin that once enslaved us, we become like the Savior whom we worship. It's a principle throughout the whole Old Testament that you become like that which you worship. That's why Israel became like the golden calf that they worshiped, hard-hearted, stiff-necked, with eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear. But as we worship Christ, as we behold his glory, we become like him as we imitate him. That's now our life goal, and the Spirit is in the process of working that truth in our lives as we walk by faith in walking by the Spirit. So in this section, Paul presents an argument that there's a close connection between thinking and living. That in walking by the Spirit, there's a close connection between thinking and living, our head and our hands. So he answers, how do we overcome sin with the Spirit? How do we live according to the Spirit? It's what you set your mind on. It's what you set your mind on. What you think about shapes your lifestyle and your character. To set your mind on something is more than just thinking about it, it's intentional. It's to be obsessive with your thinking. Full attention. Really it speaks of a worldview, the way in which we view the world. 
to have lens by which we see the world through the, through the word of God rather than through the sin of the world. So this section focuses on minding the spirit, if you will, to be preoccupied with the things that the spirit's preoccupied with, to think God's own thoughts after him. And now Romans 8, the rest of it will tell us what the spirit is preoccupied with. And in short, we see in the New Testament that the spirit is always pointing us to Jesus. That's his job, that's his role, that's what he does. He always points us to Jesus. So we pick up these truths in verse five. Let's read together. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Here now Paul makes a contrast between the thinking of the saved and the thinking of the unsaved. He starts off in verse five by contrasting the flesh and the spirit. To have fleshly living is to have fleshy thinking. There's a black and white, a clear distinction between thinking that pertains to the flesh and to the spirit. One is of the Lord and one isn't. To grow and to become like Christ, we must set our mind on the things of the spirit, spiritual things. And as we meditate and think about the gospel, we will then see how the affections of both the heart and the head lead to the actions of the hands. The affections of the the heart, the inner man, lead to the outward actions of the body. So verse 6, Paul says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So he contrasts death and life in verse 6, that although people can be alive physically, they can be dead spiritually. But to think according to the Spirit is to live life the way that God intended it to be lived. To live in fellowship and peace, shalom with God. He continues, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So he contrasts war with God and peace with God. We've seen in Romans 5.1 that we have peace with God and the peace of God, but those who don't are now at war with God. But the Spirit produces peace. Verse 8, Paul concludes this section by contrasting pleasing self and pleasing God by writing, So then, those who live according to the flesh cannot please God. The result is that those in the flesh, they fall short. They don't aim to please God, but they please themselves. They say, my will be done, not thy will be done. You can note Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4 as a parallel passage where Paul says to set your mind on the things that are above, where Christ is. So after showing the contrast between thinking according to the flesh and the spirit, Paul now addresses the church as those who are in the spirit. And he argues that because of Jesus, one day our flesh will follow suit after our spirit. That someday even our bodies will be totally renewed and made eternally alive by the spirit and that we are to live in anticipation of that. He writes about this in verses nine and on. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We see that the indwelling spirit of God, it changes everything. The person and the work of the Holy Spirit is powerful. Think about the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you. I mean, it makes sense. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, doesn't dwell in the temple or the tabernacle anymore, but now in the temple of the Holy Spirit, your body, God dwells in you. I think change is gonna happen. God is powerful. And now the Spirit gives a whole new outlook on life. And so we see here that the assurance of conversion is found in no condemnation, but the evidence of conversion is in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Again, assurance is found in no condemnation, but evidence is found through the work that the Spirit does in our life. And that's because our bodies become the dwelling place of the Spirit. 
This contrast between the flesh and the spirit is found in Galatians 5, where it depicts the difference between the fruits of the spirit and the deeds of the flesh, where Paul talks about evidence of God working in our life through love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. So Paul concludes this section now in verse 12 by writing, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So we see that the Spirit enables us to put to death the deeds of the body in order to experience true life. This really just comes down to the hard work of sanctification. The hard work of fighting against the flesh and pursuing Jesus. It's the hard work of training ourselves for godliness, Paul says. That you go to the gym physically, you go to the gym spiritually. The old school word that the Puritans used for this phrase, put to death the deeds of the body, is the word mortification. Mortification. And it was John Owen who famously said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. But the good news is, is as we strive to live holy lives through discipline, we do so without condemnation. We do so under the new covenant as we walk according to the standard of the spirit, not the standard of the law or the flesh. And this is because the resurrecting spirit of God brings new life into our mortal bodies, Paul says. So we see that the spirit changes us But now Paul's going to argue in verses 14 to 17 that the Spirit also confirms our adoption as children of God. So 1 to 13 is about the Spirit of life, and now 14 to 17 about the Spirit of adoption. Let's read it together. Paul says, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We see that being led by the Spirit reveals we are sons of God. Again, being led by the Spirit reveals we are sons of God. Instead of the spirit of bondage that leads to fear, the Spirit of God leads us in freedom into the Father's embrace. To cry out in the most endearing of terms, Paul says, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. As believers, we have the most unique privilege to call upon God in the same way that Jesus called upon his Father, to cry out, Abba, Father. It's an endearing term, meaning Papa or Daddy, one that speaks of intimacy, one that's an established trust of love and communion together. Galatians chapter four, another passage that speaks of this terminology says this, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Galatians 4 tells us that in our adoption, the spirit enters into our hearts and cries out on our behalf, Abba, Father. So the spirit first says, Abba, Father, to us, and then it enables us to cry out, Abba, Father, to God. What a beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit doesn't only convey the good news, the Spirit enacts the good news in the life of the believer. How is this possible? How does the Spirit take us from condemnation to children? It's through the beautiful term, adoption. Adoption. We can only call upon our Father in heaven because we've been adopted as children of God through Christ. Through adoption, we share in the relationship that Christ and his humanity had with his Father. Again, in adoption, we share in the relationship that Christ and his humanity had with his heavenly Father. In his book on our union with Christ, theologian Marcus Johnson writes these words. 
All the rights and privileges of being the children of God are conveyed to us in our union with God's own son. In our union with the person of Christ in salvation, we share in his personal relationship to the Father and the glorious benefits that attend that relationship, such as that we're co-heirs with Christ. We can cry to the Father as Jesus did, that the Father loves us as he loves his own Son, that the Father hears our prayers. Note this, God does not just think of us as if we were his children, we are his children through our participation in the Son. That is amazing good news that we have tonight. What should be our response to this? That of worship. Like the Apostle John in 1 John 3, 1 who says, Behold, see what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. That of a worshipful response. You know, it's amazing to see how this truth of adoption is illustrated in our culture today, in our families, even many families here in the church who have pursued adoption. And I'll never forget Pastor Vince Bueno, one of the pastors here, my good friend. After having four boys himself, which is crazy enough, right, his family went and pursued adoption and they, and they adopted two beautiful young girls. And I remember sitting in the courtroom there with their family, very thankful to be there, and seeing the judge judicially declare that this little girl has all the rights and privileges and duties of being in their family. It was legally declared and it's now relationally experienced. And the same is true for us, that we share in all of the duties and rights and responsibilities of being in God's family. And so it's through our adoption that we participate in the love that the Father has for the Son. And the Spirit, what he does is he bears witness to this truth. The indwelling spirit is present to provide an inner testimony to our divine adoption. It's an inner witness in our heart that yes, he really does love me. That the Sunday school song is true. Jesus loves me, this I know. It's an inner witness. Now this word witness is interesting because throughout the whole Old Testament, it's very important that things are established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And here the witness is the spirit of God and our spirit working together for this confirmed calling. It's like being in a court setting where a witness comes and testifies that it's true and our witness is the Holy Spirit. He's testifying with us that we belong and we are children of God. Now sometimes this can be confusing what exactly this, this witness or the testimony looks like. We know that, that our life as Christians is more than just feelings, but of course feelings are super important. Sometimes we can feel so distant from God or so near to God, so, so what exactly is this feeling? Well, whatever it may look like with all of our fluctuating feelings, it's to essentially sense God's presence and to sense his love as we call upon him as our father. You can know that you know through the work of the son on the cross and through the work of the spirit in your heart. And so it's in our times of doubt that the spirit points us to Jesus and to his finished and his accomplished work that we look to the cross of Christ and see the love of God that's been given to us. And this is the difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation drives us away from the cross, that we don't want to run to Jesus because we feel condemned in our sin. But conviction is a good thing. Now, I know conviction can be a hard word, difficult to understand at times, sort of has connotations to it. But conviction is a good thing. It's what the Spirit does. He convicts us of sin, and that's the Father's loving discipline in our lives to bring us closer to him. Condemnation drives us from the cross. Conviction, conviction makes us make a beeline to the cross, to run to the Christ and stand in the shadow of the cross. Next, Paul argues that not only are we children of God, but finally we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What a wonderful truth. Believers will receive a promised inheritance. And the greatest inheritance that we receive is God himself. What is heaven without God? Many people want heaven, but not everyone wants God necessarily. Well, that's what makes heaven so glorious, the presence of God. 
That's the greatest blessing. And we see that throughout the scripture here in Romans, that what's true of Jesus is true of us. That Romans 6, we're buried with him in baptism. That we have died to self because Jesus died. That we have new life because Jesus rose again from the grave. And Paul continues that thought here by saying that what's true of Jesus is true of us as joint heirs with Christ. We share in everything that Jesus inherits. We receive all that he receives. Our spiritual inheritance is limitless because as his fellow heirs, we share in everything that's true of Jesus. But of course, until we go to glory, we know that we must walk by faith in the spirit. And this includes suffering for the sake of the gospel. As Paul concludes now, the final verse, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. It's been observed that the believer has not fully inherited what he's been promised. He lives in hope. And we see this truth, that one must follow the path that Christ followed to glory, the path of self-sacrifice, of suffering with him and for him and the same cause for which he suffered. So what's true of him is true for us and we will suffer for the sake of the gospel, but we do so with our hope and our eyes set on glory. And the remaining uh, verses in chapter eight speak about the spirit of glory. And so brothers and sisters, as we conclude now tonight, May we be reminded of those great words that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That for us who know the Lord, we can turn to him today and cry out, Abba, Father. That if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, that the Spirit is convicting you of sin, oh, would you run to him tonight and accept his forgiveness to call upon the name of the Lord and to be saved? That we today can live in the life of the Spirit and in the life of of the spirit of adoption, amen? Amen, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word to us this evening. We thank you for the great truth that's found in our hope that's in Christ, that because of the spirit and because of the work of the son that we can call upon you as our father, Abba, Father, that you love us and you care for us. I pray that these truths would be ingrained in our hearts and minds, Lord, as we continue to walk by faith, walking in the spirit, making much of Jesus. So we love you, Lord, and we ask your blessing on the rest of our evening. We pray this together in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys.